Hello, everyone. I am Renee Franker, the editor of Blue Line Magazine. De-escalation and use of force. Terms we in policing are no stranger to, but we're certainly hearing a lot more about these words in the media today and in today's climate in general. You may remember on June 29th, 2016, Ombudsman Paul Dubay published a report titled A Matter of Life and Death, Investigation into the Direction Provided by the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services to Ontario's Police Services for De-Escalation of Conflict Situations. In this report, Dubay recommended MCSCS, which is now the Ministry of the Solicitor General, address training standards on de-escalation and use of force for police in Ontario. The report also recommended the development of a use of force model that clearly identified de-escalation options and that was understandable to the public. A University of Toronto research team led by Dr. Judith Anderson was engaged to conduct two research projects to advise the ministry's response to the Ombudsman's recommendations. The projects involved countless interviews with national and international police experts and practitioners, hundreds of hours of data collection, and a comprehensive research review. Judith P. Anderson, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, is now joining us via Zoom to talk more about these projects. Before we get into that, Anderson is the Director of the Health Adaptation Research on Trauma Lab, or the Heart Lab. She studies the psychophysiology of stress and related health and occupational issues. Her research has informed the development of an intervention known as IPREP, to, in, to enhance health and occupational effectiveness among public safety personnel by modulating atomic nervous system reactivity to stress. And she is one of our esteemed guest speakers for our very first virtual symposium on July 23rd. So make sure you register for that as well. You can do so at blueline.ca slash virtual symposium. Judith, thanks for making the time for Blue Line today. Thank you so much, Renee. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and, and have the opportunity to speak about these projects in more detail. And I'm really, really happy to discuss how the projects are solutions to the challenges that are facing police today, rather than just another series of papers. We can't wait. So before we delve deeper into these projects, um, the Ombudsman found in 2016 there was no clear def definition of de-escalation. So I want to start, I want to ask you about your definition for de-escalation. Yeah, we actually interestingly found it was more challenging than we thought to develop a definition that everyone agreed on perfectly. But in our surveys of the public, the police, and, and comparing this to what the Ombudsman had written, um, although people had different wording preferences per se, we were able to distill the core components that really aligned well with all the parties involved. The Ombudsman and so we settled on a definition of de-escalation de that includes de-escalation is the use of verbal and non-verbal techniques that match situational demands in order to bring the situation from high to low tension. Okay, I like that one. All right. On, on June 30th, uh, 2017, the U of T research team submitted to MCSCS, or now the Ministry of the Solicitor General, a report outlining the current state of de-escalation and use of force training for police in Ontario. So this was project one. Now, for the first time you're sharing that report at heartlab.net. Um, may seem like an obvious question, but given the current headlines, the climate, uh, why now? Well, we realize, you know, as a research, uh, researcher myself, that it does take time to make organization change, but we really haven't seen any implementation implementation on a provincial level with these reports and the solutions that we offered and you know i'm police uh, from around canada contact me and they ask about uh, de-escalation i just talked with a colleague the other day at a large police service and, and uh, other colleagues were calling him asking for de-escalation and what's the best evidence based training and what are solutions to some of this because they're you know there's so much public interest and so I really felt like, you know, and this project is funded by uh, public money. And so we wanted to get this information out to Canadian police services. That's fantastic. Yeah, it, uh, the time is, is perfect because everybody is asking questions and, and great questions, right, of where we go from here. So that's, that's fantastic. It's able to be read and shared. 
Okay, so with that being said, how would you currently describe the training standards on de-escalation and use of force for police in Ontario? Uh, briefly, of course, because I noted in your research, the research shows that the majority of police agencies in Ontario are committed to engaging in additional training opportunities for their officers surrounding the critical decision-making, de-escalation and non-escalation. That's a great question. And yes, even back in 2017, we found that all the you know, police services across Ontario were interested in de-escalation and even uh, beginning to investigate how they could teach that. And some were, you know, had programs that were started. One of the issues was that there was a, a lack of funds and expertise and knowledge about what is evidence-based de-escalation practices. Um, and especially in smaller services around the province, of course, they don't um, have as much um, funding or, or time as well to, to reinvent the wheel, right, at each service. So our report really provides a unified framework for the systematic evidence-based um, initiation of de-escalation and use of force training. And in our second report, which we'll get to, actually provides a graphical model representing the competencies surrounding de-escalation and use of force training. And it's really solution-based and ready for application, rather than, again, having to reinvent the wheel on this. Another issue is that's, that's a concern is that, of course, uh, there is limited training time that services have. Um, they have, you know, the provincial standards of requalification, um, but to start a whole new program of de-escalation or develop it and implement it when we really have such short um, amount of training time, um, it, it's just wasted resources to try to develop it new every year or, you know, uh, there's no... Um, systematic program that's rolled out across the province and so the learning really needs to be um, evidence-based and it should begin at the recruit stage of training and then reinforced throughout all the training opportunities even limited training opportunities provide um, the case where it can reinforce the learning that was um, learned earlier in the career and the learning needs to be scaffolded and graduated from simple to complex so we can really take advantage of limited training time if you have a systematic evidence-based training program. And well, yeah. science is clear that the brain and body work best uh, and learn best to retain information when it is presented in a gradual scaffolding framework that's reinforced by multiple exposures. Again, that's why you would want to start this um, systematic de-escalation approach from recruit training on. And then that you have multiple exposures that are reinforced by multimodal formats throughout the officer's career. So it's really an opportunity for the provincial training colleges all over Canada really to implement standardized evidence-based de-escalation training programs. Uh, and then they also, you have a train the trainers program that trains the experts that are going to be training the police officers and the recruits. And those instructors are then um, uh, assessed and uh, licensed and can demonstrate those skills that they are teaching um, in uh, to the officers. And so, yeah, this would be a very proactive approach to policing in de-escalation and, and use of force um, uh, developments rather than a reactive approach to, you know, when there's concerns arising from the public. Right, right. And, and it's great to know that, that that hunger is there. It's just uh, people don't seem to know where to go. So to have something like this now to hand them, um, we can do something about uh, that desire for, for better and, and more training. Yeah, and for knowledge. And what is evidence? And we outline that in the report, the definition of it. And we even provided uh, examples of evidence-based programs and, and why they work and why, what the outcomes are and so forth. So. Uh, so that's exciting that we were able to provide that. Fantastic. Well, well, I'm curious then, you know, what was for you the most uh, surprising finding from Project One? We were surprised that despite these kind of urgent requests from police services across the province to have and to be provided with evidence-based programming so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, that there wasn't a systematic um, a program available, but yet... So the officers and the, the leaders were turning inward to, to, um, to police to develop these programs rather than turning to experts, you know, and, and collaborating with experts in uh, the fields of de-escalation, visual design, and so forth. And no one would expect like a graphic designer to do policing 
right? And so we wouldn't expect a, you know, police officer to design or, you know, work on visual graphics. Um, and so, you know, same with uh, teaching de-escalation and, and the assessment of de-escalation and what works. There's a lot of, you know, experts out there in the world and, and uh, through these collaborations, we can create a curriculum that is evidence-based and informed by, you know, the modern uh, scientific findings. And, and stop working in those silos, right? Stop working in the silos and really that there's evidence for the importance of pulling together a multidisciplinary team of experts to design these programs uh, and training materials and experts that have um, uh, a specialty in, in making materials transparent, which is something that we included in this project. It's, it's extremely well thought out. Something like the graphics is just not, uh, you know, something I really gave a lot of thought to when it came to training. So it was eye-opening for myself, for sure. So your team made 13 evidence-based recommendations. Um, I'm curious, where do those stand as of today? Has there been any follow-up, any, any movement you can update us on? Oh, from what I know of right now, I know we had made a recommendation about curriculum review at the Ontario Police College, and I do know... Uh, the other academic that was engaged, the other team that was engaged to do that. And um, I'm not sure what progress has been um, made in that regard. And then the second, uh, one of the other recommendations that we made to develop a decision model to replace the Ontario Use Force model. And then we, we did that, we engaged in that. I also know that um, there were a lot of services uh, that were involved in the data collection stage that were interested in this research and have contacted me separately and I know that they're moving toward evidence-based practices. We haven't seen any um, official movement on the provincial level uh, for the other recommendations yet. Okay, well we will stay tuned and hopefully there'll be some more movement uh, next time we chat. <laughs> So on August 30th, 2018, the U of T team submitted a second report, um, and that includes a evidence-based critical decision-making model to guide training police in de-escalation and use of force, decision-making in response to the Ombudsman's uh, recommendations. This is project two. Uh, so this model was designed through the combined efforts of scientists, police experts, visual graphic designers, as we chatted about earlier, and community stakeholders. So the new critical decision-making model emphasizes public safety and de-escalation above all other options. In addition, the model can be trained and assessed for its effectiveness as a tool for guiding all police decisions, not just those necessitating force options. Um, so tell me a little bit more about Project 2 and some of the things that uh, really stood out for you. This is, we're just so thrilled to release this decision model because it, like I said earlier, it's a solution-based framework for policing in Canada. Um, and the model was developed, uh, you know, like you said, based on all these intensive uh, focus groups with police. So it contains all the primary principles of policing and public safety. Um, uh, and then the presentations of the principles and competencies are formatted into a visual model that's supported by science um, to reinforce de-escalation and non-escalation. And uh, there's so much work that went into this component. I still haven't got through it, uh, you know, completely. I've skimmed everything, but not read everything completely. So the language, the graphics, I mean, um, for you, what is a, a component that uh, was really a game changer uh, in this decision model? Yeah, so this model uh, is a modern solution to this public issue. So since 2016, uh, the Ombudsman highlighted, and even before then, the public has been asking for transparent materials. Why do police do what they do on calls? And is de-escalation considered on calls? And on the police side, they're saying, yes, we do de-escalation, de-escalation is considered. But without transparency in materials, um, you can see how a crisis evolves to now where the public is actually calling for defunding because they still haven't seen a level of transparency in police practicing or materials, in police practices or materials. And so the decision model is a solution in, in the following ways. One, it lays out the principles and considerations that police have to make on every call, not just mental health calls. So de-escalation is important uh, and non-escalation is important on all calls. So that's a, that's a, a primary overriding principle. Um, as you can see, when you look at the decision model, which is on page eight of our report number two, the decision model report on the heartlab.net. 
Um, it's outlined in terms of the core competencies that police have and will be trained on how to use. Then the services can actually use this uh, guide, this model, uh, to know what core competencies to train on. And they can um, create assessments to evaluate an officer's ability to demonstrate the skills, not only in training, but you know, during stress in the field. And of course, the trainers that teach the police how to conduct the calls will also be trained on these core competencies and assessed on their skill and performance under stress, demonstrating um, that to the people that they teach. And then the public can use the model to understand what happened during calls. What were all the things that the police officer had to consider? And as you can see, it's laid out with a lot of information and uh, so they can understand all the things that the, the police officer is considering. And then the officer can use the model as a guide to write up their plain language notes. Plain language is a huge part of transparency and it helps to guide anyone, not the public, not only the public to understand what's going on, but also an officer to use plain language words like, this is what I saw, this is what I did, these are the things that I tried, this didn't work because of this, this worked because of that. Uh, and so to make those notes very understandable, if they're needed later. Um, and, and, you know, also on the model, it's, it's the transparency comes through in the definitions. For example, containment. It might not be uh, initially a word that most people understand, but it's actually defined and described right in the model. So the model is really designed to facilitate learning and understanding. And it meets the governmental and educational standards of accessibility. And I'll get into that when I talk about the graphics a little bit. But, you know, in, in the modern world, all training materials, you know, at the university level or, or college prep courses, or certainly um, in, in a career professional standards, they have to meet accessibility standards, you know, such as um, for vision um, and, uh, and readability and so forth. And so, you know, the police materials are really no exception on that. Um, and so you had also asked about uh, the graphics. Yes, because uh, again, I keep going back to those. I know they're very cutting edge and they um, they really stand out and, and done by a leading expert, I believe they were was consulted for, for graphics. So, um, you know, from what I've read in terms of capability to express that complexity, uh, yeah, tell me a little bit more about those graphics and, and how it differs from the Ontario Use of Force model from uh, 2004. Absolutely. And so this is the exciting part too. We were actually able to attain one of the uh, world's leading experts in visual graphics to design like governmental materials. He was, he had since to live in Canada, Peter Stoiko. So really Canada now has this, um, you know, can be very confident in that these materials are very modern and, and scientifically supported. So, you know, vis visual science itself makes clear that the graphics on learning documents really matter. And so does the placement of information on the page. Um, and, and this may not be, you know, immediately self-evident for people because they, you know, they're not visual graphic scientists or so forth. Um, but if you think about the, the use of icons and the use of uh, central uh, graphics, even on materials like uh, now we see signs for COVID, you know, safety and so forth. Well, you see icons are used uh, when you, you should wear masks. Now that no explanation is needed, an explanation was given prior, uh, and now you just see that symbol, that icon, and it communicates the necessary information immediately to the public. And so the decision model, the graphics are centered around a central police public interaction. And the use of the um, icons is, is really a modern standard in communicating visual information. And the decision model, um, another important thing is that it defines what's meant by each term. You don't have to rely on a secondary document or risk misinterpretation. When we talk about communication, we mean verbal, nonverbal, um, you know, it's all defined and laid out there. And um, the way in which the entire graphic is actually laid out from top to bottom under the central uh, graphic, it emphasizes the overarching principles of public safety and the options for all be subject behaviors are the core components of de-escalation. This helps to the, the public to understand that de-escalation is not just verbal communication. So de-escalation can include many things, um, such as the position of the officer. So you can see one, um, 
a component of that is position. So keeping a safe distance or cover so that you don't have to use force when necessary, that's part of de-escalation. So again, it's just also educating the public in, in a variety of ways um, that uh, de-escalation and non-escalation can happen. And those are the central foundational um, components of the model. Then, of course, the use of force components, they do have to be present at times. There, it, it is necessary but they're defined, they're de-emphasized, and it's clear to the public when they might have to be used or what they would be used for. And so you had asked about comparing our graphic to the current use of force uh, model in Ontario, which is really, if you, if you think about graphs and chart types, there's something we have to learn about in school. People don't inherently understand uh, graphs like you know uh, circle graphs and line graphs and so forth. So what we found uh, from visual science with the Ontario Use Force Model, it has so many chart types layered on top of each other that it creates noise and complexity, unnecessary noise and complexity, hiding really the essential information. And uh, another issue is that you can't rely on color to relay information. So you can see right now they use color. And, and, and the reason is that because accessibility issues, some people are colorblind, even the students, police recruits. Uh, so they, they wouldn't be able to rely on the color. Uh, also, many materials, as you know, are photocopied or, or sent in black and white. And so if you are relying on color to tell you something about uh, the model, um, that will be lost. Uh, shape matters, so guiding the eye and the brain. So in the current use force model, it's in, in a circular format, um, and that kind of guides the eye towards lethal force, which also is escalating in, in red. And we've had a lot of feedback, well, circles mean dynamic, but they, but they don't inherently mean dynamic, right? Um, so that's something that, that, that can be learned, but um, better to lay things out just in a, in a plain language format. So another issue is that there, what we found even with de-escalation, so there's a ring of communication on the current use of force model. However, when we were surveying across the province, there's even different definitions of what is contained in the communication box, right? So if there's not a common language between police services uh, and between police services and the public, then there can be a lot of misinterpretation or misapplication. And so again, that doesn't facilitate the, uh, some of the officers or public thinking, you know, you should have just used verbal communication. But in that case, the police officer had to use, you know, containment and nonverbal communication. And here, the beauty of this uh, model is that it's defined. It's defined and examples are given right on the model. And that's really the modern uh, science approach to communicating information transparently. Uh, so overall, the, the, the model meets the standards and specific requests by the ombudsman, but it really goes above and beyond in terms of the science-based uh, communication of information. Yes. And it, yeah, so interestingly, I, I had my 15-year-old, <laughs> I made her sit down with both models, and I asked her to describe to me about police. She's, you know, she only knows that her mom works in this field. But uh, she saw both models, and she, I said, describe to me what police do. And, you know, and from, from the decision model, it's, you know, oh, she can just read it and, and, and comprehend. Oh, they would do this. They, oh, they, they might do this and that. But on the current Ontario Use of Force model, um, you just don't know what's contained in, in, uh, in communication or tactical uh, considerations and so forth. Wow. Yeah. So it leaves uh, some things open to interpretation, whereas this modern version is transparent and explains uh, everything, it sounds like. And, and from what I saw myself and, and I uh, loved how uh, there was a note about, you know, the rainbow of colors and how that is not helping anybody. <laughs> right. I can't rely on, on color to communicate. Exactly, yeah. Especially, I mean, even just myself, I've moved to a home office and I have only a black and white printer, right? So it would be lost on me, exactly. So um, I know the internal monitoring component. Uh, it really struck me as, as something new and modern and necessary. Um, I've been having discussions with others, uh, leaders in the, the law enforcement community about the internal monitoring component to use of force and de-escalation and non-escalation. Um, so I, I want to 
learn a little bit more from you about that uh, and why it's such a, a shift in policing. Absolutely. So yeah, stress modulation and emotion regulation are really part of this paradigm shift in policing, where we're recognizing not only as research scientists, um, but as police uh, services and the public, recognizing that these internal factors within the officer do have direct effects on the outcomes of calls. And we know that because uh, there's been more uh, research tools that we can measure stress responses in the field with officers actually in active duty. So there, science is clear on this aspect. Stress, high pressure, potentially conflictual situations, which are what police face quite often, uh, stimulate stress responses. And that can actually um, you know, inhibit an officer from using the skills they have been trained on. So a, a dramatic example of that would be like a police officer shooting at the hood of a car. That's not part of the training. That's ineffective and you know, it's not gonna stop the car. And why would this happen when you think about it later or public or even their colleagues, why would they do that? Well, it's a stress response. You can see it also, you know, it's a life threat, a car's coming at them. Uh, this is a natural uh, response as a human uh, to, a, to a, flight, a fight or flight um, life threat. But that doesn't align with police training, you see? So we do know uh, clearly from science that stress has an effect on outcomes. And so uh, creating a competency on the decision model and within police training um, itself overall is necessary. Because the good news is that we can learn to modulate physiological responses to stress and training. Um, my work and that of colleagues now, there's, there's a, a large body of research that shows you can learn to modulate stress responses overall. Obviously, there's going to be some life-threatening situations where you know, nothing, nothing would help. You know, the outcome is going to be bad. We're humans, and there's only so much expectation you can have of people. But for your on average and for for many of these um, calls that contain stress we, that's the good news you can modulate it and so that can be that's part of evidence-based training and that can be integrated into training definitely and, and needs to be it's almost um you know because the training is so uh varied from service to service and across uh, the country um the fact that some officers aren't getting that type of training unless they're seeking it right is is a concern so yeah, and this is, you know, again, with the model, what's, what makes this model so useful, like as a solution, is that it lays out these competencies, and then the service is responsible for finding the evidence base uh, 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 programs and instituting them so the officers can get that training. And then they can be assessed on how they can they demonstrate performing uh, that training under real world stress. Can they demonstrate these skills? And if they can't, they can't. I mean, there's, you know, not everybody is cut out for, for certain roles. Like I wouldn't be a surgeon. I, I couldn't you know, do that under the, the stress that that requires. So this also helps the services to be able to say, okay, we have some standards by which we, we know that officers are performing well or they're not. And this is maybe not the right career choice for them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. That's only going to help uh, down the road. So what is one big thing you want Canadian police officers, and, and I'm talking about officers of all ranks here, to, to know about this research and, and this new model. Yeah, with what I hope happens across Canada is when we get more of this information out in a systematic manner is that they adopt these programs that have evidence base and that they create, using the uh, materials like this decision model creates a common language across Canada. So if you are a member of the public or you know, need to call the police in a different province, you can have this kind of same expectation of you know, how, how uh, their skills, how they're trained, and um, you know, the outcomes uh, uh, of the call. Fantastic. Yep, that greater understanding right across the board. Yes. So what about um, application of the research for both these projects? You know, what are, what are your hopes for policing in Ontario in regards to decision making and, and use of force going forward now, now that it is easily available? Um, yeah, we would like to see, um, and like I've called for in the reports, uh, transparency to the public. So in, in our first report, 
first project, we went to other countries and we found that like in the UK and Finland, other places, they actually post curriculum online. So the public has access to review this. They post, you know, who's teaching what, what their expertise is, how the officers are being assessed, how the trainers are being assessed, what are the requirements. And so, like I said, so this is all transparent. And it's transparent to people who want to become police officers as well. There are these professional standards, and, and here's how we uh, uh, make sure that these professional standards are in, enforced and, uh, and lived by. Wow, Judith, thank you so much for this informative and this uh, extremely necessary chat today on your work. It's evidence-based material uh, that can truly make a difference. And, and we're just so grateful you shared some of your findings and, and your thoughts overall here with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Renee, for being here. And really, you know, I'm open to questions if, if police services have questions about the research. Um, Fantastic. Yes, I'll make sure to link uh, the website where we can get this research uh, on the website article that's going to be attached to this video. So, and we look forward to your live virtual presentation with uh, Stephen Plotplowski on uh, July 23rd. So all the details again, blueline.ca slash virtual symposium. See you then. See you then, Renee. Take care.